we're not just Timson these days. We've uh, somehow we've uh, grown quite a lot. We've also got uh, very strong in this part of the world a business called Max Spielman, which uh, we're very proud of. We're also involved with another business called uh, Johnson's The Cleaners, and we've got a business down in London called Snappy Snaps that also does photo. And uh, a few weeks ago, we passed the landmark of opening our 2000th shop, which I never believed would ever happen. Uh, and it's probably happened because we're a private business and we can do what the hell we like. <laughs> and uh, because we've always run it in our own way. We, we don't have a marketing department. We don't do any research. Uh, we just sort of try and follow common sense if we can. And... Uh, we try and keep things simple. That makes a big difference. Uh, we do try and think ahead, and so we spend a lot of time thinking. Uh, but mainly, you're trying to think, well, how can we make the shots better? Uh, and uh, the big, biggest moment came about 25 years ago when I had a sort of light bulb moment, a bit of luck, uh, when event eventually, after having I mean, run the business for 20-something years, I discovered the secret behind customer service. Now, it's a bit embarrassing to say that because the secret is blindingly obvious and really terribly simple, but most people don't get it. And uh, the secret is you can't do it by a set of rules. You can't create great, great service by having lots of training schemes or even putting notices in the back, st back stock room which say, smile, you're on stage, or... Uh, don't forget, always, don't forget the customers come first, all these notices. None of that. The secret is very simply to trust the people who serve the customers to do it the way they want. That's it. You are the leader, you're the thinker, but you're not the doer. They're the ones who do the job, so let them get on with it. Uh, and uh, if you want to make your life simple, make sure you've got a good manager in every shop. I was, uh, there's a guy who came, I came to talk to my area managers about this time who I discovered, uh, Dean Butler he's called, he brought Vision Express from, the, from Canada in here and uh, he, he liked simple as well and he, before he came over to, over to the UK he had a chain of shops across Canada, you don't need that many shops in Canada because it's not, not a great population and he got all the shops he needed and he said I had one year and I just have one objective which is make sure I got a great manager in every branch and he had the best year he ever had. And the other thing he taught me is that uh, actually one of the things that we do wrong as managers, we spend most of our time with the people who are no good. And you should, you should leave your time to... Well, if you've got a good manager every shop, then you're looking after good shops all the time. And the other thing I try to explain them that actually your job as a manager is to look after the people. And... Uh, that means really being, being a mentor, being available, letting people help you. That's what a manager... And so we spent a lot of time talking about this, and eventually we got there. Uh, but I was pretty Im impatient, so uh, we t I wanted to get on with this, uh, giving people the freedom. So I, because the people in the shops were frightened, because they thought their bosses were going to tell them off, I said, well, here's, here's a couple of little guidelines for you. You think of them as rules. You can spend, whoever you are, even if it's your first week, you can spend up to £500 to settle a complaint without talking to anyone else. And that got rid of one of the biggest sources of complaints, which is the complaints don't get deal, dealt with properly. And uh, that gave a good feeling of, of how empowered they were. Uh, second thing I said is, if you've got a good reason to give someone a discount, you're, it's entirely up to you. The price list is just a guide. You know, Bob runs our shop in Taunton. Taunton isn't the biggest town in the UK. Uh, it shouldn't be one of the top five shops every week in the whole company. But it is because of Bob, because he creates. He runs it his way. He has a fantastic character, which you can see in his face, and he gets it across to his, the rest of his team, the rest of the customers, and he's great. But when we started to do this upside-down management thing, we weren't looking for Bob, we were looking for shoe repairers and key cutters. But if you've got someone with personality, you can teach them how to cut keys and how to repair shoes. But 
If you've got a very, very, very skillful but grumpy cobbler, you can't change their personality to get them to look after, after customers. So I, I had to find a way to explain to the people who are doing the recruitment out in the field, I want you to look for personality, look for, look for people, not for what they do. And uh, came up with the idea of, of this thing, which is my uh, Mr. Man interview form, where you've got a whole series of characters, of Mrs. Happy, Mr. Friendly, Mr. Helpful, all those sort of people, and then the other other part of the form has Mr. Grumpy, Mr. Dull, and Mr. Mr. Useless, or whoever we got there. And it's very simple. I'm not interested in what people, what qualifications they've got. I don't care you know, whether they've got letters after their name. I don't care what they've put on their application form. I just want the right personality. So I ask the interview, interviewer to tick the boxes under the pictures that most fit the person in front of them. And then if we've got someone who, who ticks the right positive boxes, we ask them to work in one of our shops for half a day, and if alongside someone who really gets it, and that basically tells us all we want to know. And that's how we've been recruiting people for the last 20 something years. Do you know it makes a hell of a difference? I guarantee that, I mean, it doesn't always work, they don't always get it right, but uh, the number of people who say to me, how, I was in your shop in so and so the other day. What a nice, nice guy, nice girls you got there. Uh, how do you find such nice people? Well, that's how we do it. Um, where do they come from? Well, just under 50% are introduced by people who already work for us. So we give them a little bit of a bribe to do it. Uh, but uh, they, know, they know, because they're good in, the, in themselves, they'll know the people who are good that they know. So we've got lots of friends and relatives. So. That's the main source of our recruits. Second biggest source of recruits is from prison, which uh, was just happened by chance because my son James, who runs the business, has done for some time. He just started to be chief exec and he visited a prison near Warrington called Thorg Cross. And uh, Matt, the guy who showed him around, because James was organizing some function in there. Matt impressed James so much, James said, well, here's my business card, when you get out, Get in touch, I'll, give you, I'll find you a job. And Matt's still with us. And uh, he's prompted us to sort of think we ought to know more, more about employing people from prison. And we quickly discovered that uh, over 60% of people who leave prison reoffend within two, two years and go back. And that figure drops to less than 20% for those who've got a job. So there was some point in doing it. Then we did realize there was another big point of us getting interested because there were uh, 85,000 people in prison in this country. And at that time, there was no one positively recruiting from prison. Uh, so we got interested. Uh, and we learned a lot. I mean, we made some mistakes. We tried to employ people who really were almost unemployable. Some people are too naughty for us to be able to cope with. A lot of... Uh, a lot have mental health problems, uh, drug addiction, which again, we are really not equipped to deal with, but there's a hell of a lot of people in prison who've made one bad choice, had one bit of bad luck, and that makes life difficult for them forevermore. And uh, for a lot of those, uh, the problems really start when they come out of prison. That's when life gets really difficult because difficult to open a bank account, they probably haven't got anywhere to live, their family might have broken up, very often they don't even get to see their children. All sorts of problems that uh, all come. I mean, it's not surprising, quite a lot of people try to get back into prison because they feel happier there. Uh, so, but what we do, I mean, lots of people help people from prison, but we, like we, as I say, we like doing a sim simple, do it simple. And, our simple thing is, if you come and work for us, you work for us on the same terms as everyone else. It's not a part-time thing, it's not just a, a sort of some sort of apprenticeship. You're full-time, you've got the same opportunities, and you're, you're with colleagues the same way. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, and, but we do have to do a little bit of extra support in those sort of areas, particularly housing and lending money in the first, first instance, because you, you've got to get, from the off, got to your first payday before you can survive. You only get something about 50, 60 quid when you get out of prison. So we have to be conscious of those things. I was, 
I was very dubious. It was James's scheme, really, and I was dubious. And I thought, I don't know what our colleagues are going to say. I don't know what our customers are going to say. But I couldn't, be, couldn't have been more wrong because uh, the success of us employing people from prison has been actually the people in the business and how they've helped them. It could, wouldn't have worked if they hadn't had the support of the colleagues who were working alongside them. And, uh, I mean, particularly, I mean, we've got a couple of people in the bottom left-hand left corner of that uh, slide there where, uh, who do nothing else, but their life is, is interviewing people in prison and supporting those that would join us. And Darren, the guy who does that, he joined us from prison, so he's very well aware of the, the difficulties that people face. Um, and the way it works best, I mean, we've got, we've got seven different workshops inside prisons, which are part, mainly training workshops, but some are real workshops. Um, and we interview in, in about 70 different prisons around the country. But the most successful way it happens is when someone starts working for us when they're still in prison. So today, there will have been about 40 people who left prison this morning and went to work in one of our shops. It's called Rottle, release, released on temporary license. And that can happen to, for any time up to a year from, from release. And, uh, I mean, some people get, get on so well, they're managing their own shop while they're still in prison, which uh, I think is... Uh, yeah. uh, and, of course, the day after they leave, they've still got the job. They're straight into it. And that, that's why it works so well. Um, the... The other thing I was worried about, what customers would think. But, uh, do you know, a lot of people now quote the fact we've, they all know, we've made no secret about it. I did to start with, but now I don't. Um, the fact that we, we, we have so many, we have uh, 650, I think, at the moment, people who are working right now for us who joined us from prison. A lot of people quote that as a reason why they come to us as customers, because they think they're married. And, uh, just going back to those statistics of over 60% reoffended within two years, uh, and it goes down to 19% if they've got a job, well, our percentage is actually under 3%. Not only that, we've got, we've got area managers who joined us from prison, we've got one divisional director who joined us from prison. Uh, Probably they outperform the people that, that 10% of our recruitment, it is 10% of our workforce, uh, they outperform the, the others. So uh, there's some remarkable personal stories. Anyway, I, I mentioned that uh, actually that this, this, I don't take any credit for what we've done with, uh, with ex-offenders. That's my son James who's done all that. And uh, I did take a bold decision when he was about 30, 31, and handed over the, uh, the running of the business to him. And uh, I, was a very, I really was a little bit nervous when uh, he went off on one of these fact-finding tours of, uh, went over to the States, you know, went to the uh, Southwest Airlines and Ritz-Carlton and a group of uh, upwardly mobile young people about well under half my age, and uh, I thought he'd come back and want to revolutionise the business and I'd be completely yesterday's man. But actually James came back and said, uh, what I found, that, that no one, we're doing most of this stuff already, but they're much better at talking about it. What we've got to do is to make sure we don't lose what we've got, and we've got to somehow make, make it much more part of our culture. So we did a few things when we following his trip. And one, one was, uh, we started what we called our residential, so everyone who joins us comes for a 24-hour session at Manchester where, uh, where we've, uh, we've got our training center um, to talk about upside down management, what our culture is about. So within the first, hopefully within the first six months, once they've stayed that long, they really learn what upside down management is about. And we also had, uh, what we, we call our leadership course, which just talked about how, as managers, all, the, all our middle and senior managers go about upside-down management, how you run, how you, how you are a boss the way we like bosses to be. And then the other thing, James said, you've got to write a book about it too. So, because you've got to put down what are, what are things that work, what are, what are the magic dust that make it work? because 
there's always a, I've always felt that on this upside down management thing that for all the time we're against a piece of elastic that's trying to pull us back to what everyone else does, you know, that's sort of uh, best practice. We don't do best practice, we do our practice. But and we've, we've had some disasters. We had one a few years ago when uh, we employed a se fairly senior executive from, yeah, from somewhere else. And she managed to change, change the, uh, one of the best parts of our business within a year from being a 10% increase to a 5% decrease because she didn't understand how the upside down thing works and she wanted to tell everyone what to do. So we, we, we think the culture is very, very important. The, the biggest thing that's made it happen for it, amazingly, are the people who were the most difficult people to start with, the middle management team, the area managers out in the field, who are my secret weapon that really make it work. And uh, they, their most important job, already mentioned, is uh, to pick the best people, pick the personalities. People is, I think it's best to think of people, marking people out of ten. I want a business full of nines and tens. Trouble is we, we put up with sixes, sevens and eights. But you, know, you want a great business, you want to be full of nines and tens. And for that reason, uh, the second most important job our area teams do is to get rid of the people who aren't good enough. <laughs> do you know, as their role, they're most, probably you know, right up there in their job description, not that they have one because we don't really believe in those type of things, but, in, but up there in what they, they should be achieving is to look after the people and make, it, make, make for all the really good people ensure they really enjoy their time at work. And one of the best ways you can make sure everyone enjoys their time at work is to make sure they're working alongside people who love the business as much as they do. And there's nothing more motiv demotivating than to expect someone to work alongside somebody who is a job's worth, does go and stick it, sort of spends all the time complaining when they're at work. Those people are the ones that waste management time. They're the ones where 85% of the ma management time is spent on those people who don't make the contribution. And we believe that actually the sensible thing to do for, for them and for us is to have uh, an honest conversation, we call it part of friends conversation which goes something like your best will never be good enough for us and it's time for you for us to help you to find your happiness elsewhere uh, as but doing it as nicely and as generously and as quickly as possible and it's something that the bigger the business the less it seems able to do it so and the big corporates are lousy at getting, they, they get rid of all the good people in a round of redundancies rather than getting rid of the people who are not contributing. So we think that's a very important part of running a business. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, our people aren't allowed to tell anyone what to do. That's fundamental to the way we run things. We hope they will listen a lot because uh, if someone's, it was really good, starts to be not so good, I'll guarantee there's something on, going on in the rest of their lives. And we're there to help them. That's, that's a big part of uh, what our day-to-day man -day managers are there for. And very often they're talking about the sort of problems that a lot of people face, whether it be addiction of various types, relationship problems, debt problems, bereavement, things that they need help, they need to talk about. And it's important for the boss to earn enough respect so they are the person they're, they're, they're talking to. As far as debt's concerned, we have a simple answer to that. We just lend them the money, as long as it's not too much. If it's 1,000, 2,000, maybe 2,500 pounds, we lend them the money, they can get their minds back to work, and it stops them breaking rule number two, which, if you remember, is put the money in the till. Uh, apart from that, we do lots of other things just to... We've got good people, we want to really look after them, which is why we've now got 11 holiday homes scattered around the UK where our colleagues stay for free. Uh, everyone who works for us gets their birthday off. We've been doing that for 14 years now. Doesn't cost anything. Uh, and it's just nice, really nice. Uh, 
And we have a thing called Dreams Come True, which is about the only thing I'm mentioning here which really was my idea, apart from the interview form. Um, and uh, this is simple. Every month, uh, we promise that at least one colleague's dream will come true. And these aren't little dreams, they're mainly big dreams. Like They tend to involve travel to the other side of the world to meet long-lost relative, or some, quite a few have been to Vegas to get married. Uh, the, uh, we've had done lots of dental treatments, which people can't afford, but need to have. Uh, and we even paid for a divorce, which was... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> at, um, yeah, well, one of the things that really, really showed, taught me uh, how important it is to have a, a business full of great nines and tens. Uh, we took, two years ago, James's idea. It was 150 years since my great-grandfather uh, opened our first shop. And so he said, well, we'll take 150 colleagues off to, went to Malta for five days. Uh, and they were not the bosses. They were all frontline people uh, nominated by their peers. And so they were all nines. We had the most amazing time because you were putting... 150 fantastic personalities together. And they, they still talk to each other. They have their own WhatsApp. They have this, that, and the other. And uh, that, that taught me a lot. Um, also, I, I think the, the same principle applies to me, uh, that uh, when it comes to being the boss, I can't, I can't issue any orders. Sorry, I come back in a minute. I can't issue any orders. But nor do I have to be, do what I'm told to do, which is why I don't follow best practice. And I'm quite keen to not follow any regulations if I don't think they're sensible. So I think you, I think you have to have the courage to, uh, to ignore some of the rules from time to time. One of the things I, I found as the business got bigger is that uh, I, I was starting each week, this is when I was running it, this is... Uh, 20 years ago, I discovered every week started with a lot of uh, problems, and I got quite, quite miserable. And uh, so I, I just invented this pad. It says, uh, "Please send me some good news." So I don't know why I, did, I just did it to cheer myself up. And uh, <laughs> and they started coming back. So what we did, we took all the the good news and we put it into a newsletter, and. Then, at about the third week of putting it into this newsletter, I said, and the best news of the week is this, and that gets 20 pounds. So that was a reward. So more and more good news came in. And do you know, somehow we created a, a positive form of communication. Lots of businesses find it very difficult to, make, to have a, any sort of company magazine. And it, by the time it's printed, you do it quarterly, and it's all half the people have left who are in it, and all that. Uh, through starting this, we actually have uh, a weekly newsletter that goes to 16 pages, which is all about the people. And that's one of those things I call the magic dust. That's one of the things that creates, uh, creates the culture. Uh, just illustrating how I don't follow the rules, we don't follow the rules. We've thrown out EPOS systems from every business we've bought. We don't do electronic point of sale. All this business of knowing your customers, all this sort of thing. Do you know why? We, because what those things do is it makes sure a head office controls the business. It tells the, 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 the uh, colleagues turn up in the morning, they find the price has been changed by head office, that sort of thing. So we don't, we, we, we make sure our technology leaves, leaves the people free. Don't do appraisals. I think. I'm ashamed to say I, did, I used to do it years ago, and I now realize they are a terrible waste of time and a, and a cause of great anguish. And uh, I'm, a, I'm ashamed how often I told really good people how they could improve, and really useless people try to find something they've done well. And <laughs> so don't do that anymore. But, uh, uh, and we don't... Uh, don't worry about uh, KPIs or whatever. I mean, you know, he's got so much information. All this big data getting bigger and bigger all the time, I think it gets in the way. I think uh, I get my data by just going around visiting the shops, which I'll be doing when I leave here today. So we, we run it in a bizarre sort of way. And uh, just finally, it, uh, 
I mean, part of the reason for that is uh, I was taught to do that by my late wife, Annex, who, uh, who was the ultimate believer in common sense. She didn't, she didn't take any notice of what anyone else said, but uh, she did things her, her way. And uh, I, I probably should have realized that her, her big passion was about, uh, about children. So uh, when we had three children, when the youngest one went to school, she told me, no, we, we discussed it, and, uh, <laughs> and we became foster carers. And, so, and you go through a process of you, you're interviewed by a social worker, then interviews your friends to see whether you were lying, and then they come back and you, and then you go up to a panel and they approve you, and then nothing happens for quite some time. And then suddenly I came home and found uh, they've got two extra children at home. <laughs> but, uh, that's two, my, my, James is the one with his back to us, and Edward, my politician-type son, is at the head of the table, and these other two children uh, were the start of the fostering thing. I mean, they, they, were, they were a breeze, really, those two. They, they stayed with them for six, stayed with us for six months, so that's what you did in those days. And the t six months today, ten days before Christmas, they were taken, and we were told they'd gone to another, another foster family, but they hadn't, actually. They'd gone to the local children's home, which was... Mm. So never forgiven them for that. The next lot, were, they were much more testing. That they, they came with cigarette burns, and they've quite, uh, the little lad was the one who smashed 110 frames in my greenhouse with a sledgehammer. Just, and we well, can understand these kids. They, they actually behave like that for a reason. It's a form of communication. They're not being naughty. No, it's, it's because of what's happened in their early life. Uh, this was a more interesting assignment. <laughs> we had uh, these triplets who were blah, 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 about uh, four months old. Thank God they only stayed for 10 weeks. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a long time ago because health and safety was quite difficult, <laughs> different. <laughs> uh, all right, so Alex and I, we, we had 90 kids in total, so, some for a very short time, some for quite a long time, uh, and, you know, learnt amazing things, I love wonderful stories and memories, and, but learnt quite a lot. Uh, this is the one that taught me more than any, he's called Ollie. He came to us when he was six, with a view to be adopted, we adopted him when he was seven, and uh, he tested the patience of five different schools, and he got thrown out of the Chester Cathedral Choir. He had a wonderful treble voice. And it was all, all fine until he, he got a bit older. I mean, when they're naughty and they're older, it's not so nice. And uh, we, got, we, we started worrying we weren't looking after him very well, because I mean, it wasn't a foster child, it was a doctor child, it was part of our family. And, uh, you know, and friends, the worst bit was when the friend said to Alex, what, send Ollie to, to us for a week, we'll soon sort him out, which was very cruel. Anyway, uh, we, found, we suddenly had, come to it, Alex had her light, light bulb moment when it came to, she went to a, a, uh, a training course, uh, which she seldom did, and the training was about uh, for a guy called Dan Hughes, and she learnt about attachment, the fact that if you don't have the care of, you know, don't, don't, don't have the love of a carer in the early two, few years. It doesn't have to be two. I don't, it, uh, it's, it's a continuous process. If you haven't got someone who's there to look after you, who's there for you to trust, then you are going to quite often grow up with what, what attachment problems. That's what Ollie's have got. So uh, that's why I got involved in that, and I wrote that little book which, uh, about attachment. And... The other thing that the fostering led me to is the fact that Alex was uh, governor at the local school, which um, took a lot of our foster children. And one day the, the school was down for closure. It was listed for closure, and Alex says, you have to do something about it. So my do something about it was to go to the, the local authority, the head of children's services, and try and bribe her by saying, I, I'll give them a bursary, which was... 30,000 a year for five years to extend the curriculum to make it a centre of excellence and all these wonderful words that uh, actually were enough to keep the, keep the school open. But uh, it wasn't very long before Alex came again and said, well, the chair, chair of the governors is moving, moving jobs, moving away, there's a step down, you'll have to do that too. And that's uh, so when I, I met Steve, who was the head. We had 42 kids in the school. 
so it, it was pretty well unviable. Poor chap was having to do most of the work. Uh, and I just said, take, move, the, move that computer off your desk. Forget about all the regulations and policies that are coming from the local authority. Don't bother to see your school improvement partner from uh, down the road who you hate. And, uh, <laughs> and just spend your life. Use that money we've given you, but just open the eyes of the kids to the world around them. Look after the children, because that's what you're here for. And he came on our leadership course, and he heard about upside-down management. And uh, it worked, because... Uh, it became, had a, had a outstanding Ofsted within three years. It became the first primary academy in the UK, and uh, it's, for the last four years, it's been been full. 168 kids, and we had 100 apply to get into the first form this for this time this term, which uh, they only take 24. So that's why what I'm doing now is uh, spending some time to, trying to talk to a lot of schools. I've got. I've got a lot of teachers coming to my house for lunch tomorrow to talk about uh, how they should become aware of attachment and the sort of things that affect Ollie so that they can give a proper education to look after children because I think schools is where we can spread that attachment message. And uh, so when you go to one of our shops, you'll see uh, what we now call the Alex Stimson Trust, uh, which is mainly about, we're, we're, doing, we're funding research, looking to attachment in schools. Uh, we collect the money by doing small jobs. Uh, we give all the three books I've written about attachment. They're available for free for any of our shops, and there are plenty of shops near, near here. And we also use some of that money to, uh, we bought a couple of holiday homes that, which are available for foster carers. So, uh, and by sort of using, Using our branch network and uh, the bit of knowledge that uh, we've got of attachment, that's what we do. So, uh, the freeholders. Uh, so, if you want to know more, you could buy the latest book, Keys to Success. Uh, but perhaps even better is just go to one of our shops and talk to the people and ask them whether they actually do understand about upside down management and whether it makes a difference. And if you want to know any more, I'm john at timson.com. <laughs>